War by Jack London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He was a young man, not more than twenty-four or five, and he might have set his horse with the careless grace of his youth had he not been so cat-like and tense. His black eyes roved everywhere, catching the movements of twigs and branches where small birds hopped, questing onward through the changing vistas of trees and brush, and returning always to the clumps of undergrowth on either side. And as he watched, so did he listen. Though he rode on in silence, save for the boom of heavy guns far to the west, this had been sounding monotonously in his ears for hours, and only its cessation would have aroused his notice, for he had business closer to hand. Across his saddle bow was balanced a carbine. So tensely was he strung that a bunch of quail, exploding into flight from under his horse's nose, startled him to such an extent that automatically, instantly, he had reined in and fetched the carbine halfway to his shoulder. He grinned sheepishly, recovered himself, and rode on. So tense was he, so bent upon the work he had to do, that the sweat stung his eyes, unwiped and unheeded, rolled down his nose and spattered his saddle pommel. The bend of his cavalryman's hat was fresh stained with sweat. The roan horse under him was likewise wet. It was high noon of a breathless day of heat. Even the birds and squirrels did not dare the sun, but sheltered in shady hiding places among the trees. Man and horse were littered with leaves and dusted with yellow pollen, for the open was ventured no more than was compulsory. They kept to the brush and trees, and invariably the man halted and peered out before crossing a dry glade or naked stretch of upland pasturage. He worked always to the north, though his way was devious, and it was from the north that he seemed to most apprehend that for which he was looking. He was no coward, but his courage was only that of the average civilized man, and he was looking to live, not die. Up a small hillside he followed a cow path, through such dense scrub that he was forced to dismount and lead his horse, but when the path swung around to the west he abandoned it and headed to the north again, along the oak-covered top of the ridge. The ridge ended in a steep descent, so steep that he zigzagged back and forth across the face of the slope, sliding and stumbling among the dead leaves and matted vines and keeping a watchful eye on the horse above that threatened to fall down upon him. The sweat ran from him, and the pollen dust settling pungently in mouth and nostrils increased his thirst. Try as he would, nevertheless, the descent was noisy, and frequently he stopped, panting in the dry heat and listening for any warning from beneath. At the bottom he came out on a flat, so densely forested that he could not make out its extent. Here the character of the woods changed, and he was able to remount. Instead of the twisted hillside oaks, tall straight trees, big-trunked and prosperous, rose from the damp, fat soil. Only here and there were thickets, easily avoided while he encountered winding, park-like glades where the cattle had pastured in the days before war had run them off. His progress was more rapid now. As he came down into the valley, and at the end of half an hour, he halted at an ancient rail fence on the edge of a clearing. He did not like the openness of it, yet his path lay across to the fringe of trees that marked the banks of the stream. It was a mere quarter of a mile across that open, but the thought of venturing out in it was repugnant. A rifle, a score of them, a thousand, might lurk in that fringe by the stream. Twice he essayed to start, and twice he paused. He was appalled by his own loneliness. The pulse of war that beat from the west suggested the companionship of battling thousands. Here was naught but silence, and himself, and possibly death-dealing bullets from a myriad ambushes. And yet his task was to find what he feared to find. He must on and on, till somewhere, sometime, he encountered another man or other men from the other side, scouting as he was scouting, to make report, as he must make report, of having come in touch. Changing his mind, he skirted inside the woods for a distance, and again peeped forth. This time, in the middle of a clearing, he saw a small farmhouse. There were no signs of life, no smoke curled from the chimney, not a barnyard fowl clucked and strutted. The kitchen door stood open, and he gazed so long and hard into the black aperture that it seemed almost that a farmer's wife must emerge at any moment. He licked the pollen and dust from his dry lips, stiffened himself, mind and body, and rode out into the blazing sunshine. Nothing stirred. He went on past the house and approached the wall of trees and bushes by the river's bank. One thought persisted maddeningly. It was of the crash into his body of a high-velocity bullet. It made him feel very fragile and defenseless, and he crouched lower in the saddle. Tethering his horse in the edge of the wood, he continued a hundred yards on foot till he came to the stream. Twenty feet wide it was, without perceptible current. 
cool and inviting, and he was very thirsty. But he waited inside the screen of leafage, his eyes fixed on the screen on the opposite side. To make the wait endurable, he sat down, his carbine resting on his knees. The minutes passed, and slowly his tenseness relaxed. At last he decided there was no danger. But just as he prepared to part the bushes and bend down to the water, a movement among the opposite bushes caught his eye. It might be a bird, but he waited. Again there was an agitation of the bushes, and then, so suddenly that it almost startled a cry from him, the bushes parted and a face peered out. It was a face covered with several weeks' growth of ginger-colored beard. The eyes were blue and wide apart, with laughter wrinkles in the corners that showed despite the tired and anxious look of the whole face. All this he could see with microscopic clearness, for the distance was no more than twenty feet, and all this he saw in such brief time that he saw it as he lifted his carbine to his shoulder. He glanced along the sights and knew he was gazing upon a man who was as good as dead. It was impossible to miss at such point-blank range. But he did not shoot. Slowly he lowered the carbine and watched. A hand clutching a water bottle became visible, and the ginger beard bent downward to fill the bottle. He could hear the gurgle of the water, then arm and bottle, and ginger beard disappeared behind the closing bushes. A long time he waited. When with thirst on slack, he crept back to his horse, rode slowly across the sun-washed clearing, and passed into the shelter of the woods beyond. Another day, hot and breathless, a deserted farmhouse, large, without buildings, in an orchard, standing in a clearing. From the woods on a roan horse, carbine across pommel, rode the young man with the quick black eyes. He breathed with relief as he gained the house. That a fight had taken place here earlier in the season was evident. Clips and empty cartridges, tarnished with verdigris, lay on the ground, which, while wet, had been torn up by the hooves of horses. Hard by the kitchen garden were graves, tagged and numbered. From the oak tree by the kitchen door, in tattered, weather-beaten garments, hung the bodies of two men. The faces shriveled and defaced, bore no likeness to the faces of men. The roan horse snorted beneath them. The rider caressed and soothed it, and tied it farther away. Entering the house, he found the interior a wreck. He trod on empty cartridges as he walked from room to room to reconnoiter from the windows. Men had camped and slept everywhere and on the floor of one room he came upon stains unmistakable where the wounded had been laid down. Again outside he led the horse around behind the barn and invaded the orchard. A dozen trees were burdened with ripe apples. He filled his pockets, eating while he picked. Then a thought came to him, and he glanced at the sun. Calculating the time of his return to camp, he pulled off his shirt, tying the sleeves and making a bag. This he proceeded to fill with apples. As he was about to mount his horse, the animal suddenly pricked up its ears. The man, too, he listened and heard faintly the thud of hoofs on the soft earth. He crept to the corner of the barn and peered out. A dozen mounted men, strung out loosely, approaching from the opposite side of the clearing, were only a matter of a hundred yards or so away. They rode on to the house. Some dismounted, while others remained in the saddle, as an earnest that their stay would be short. They seemed to be holding a council, for he could hear them talking excitedly in the detested tongue of the alien invader. The time passed, but they seemed unable to reach a decision. He put the carbine away in its boot, mounted, and waited impatiently, balancing the shirt of apples on his pommel. He heard footsteps approaching, and drove his spurs so fiercely into the roan as to force a surprise groan from the animal as it leaped forward. At the corner of the barn he saw the intruder, a mere boy of nineteen or twenty, for all of his uniform jumped back to escape being run down. At the same moment the roan swerved and its rider caught a glimpse of the aroused men by the house. Some were springing from their horses, and he could see the rifles going to their shoulders. He passed the kitchen door and dried corpses swinging in the shade, compelling his foes to run around the front of the house. A rifle cracked, and a second, but he was going fast, leaning forward low in the saddle, one hand clutching the shirt of apples, the other guiding the horse. The top bar of the fence was four feet high, but he knew his roan and leaped it at full career to the accompaniment of several scattered shots. Eight hundred yards straight away were the woods, and the roan was covering the distance with mighty strides. Every man was now firing, pumping their guns so rapidly that he no longer heard individual shots. A bullet went through his hat, but he was unaware, though he did not know when another tore through the apples on the pommel, and he winced and ducked even lower when a third bullet, fired low, struck a stone between the horse's legs and ricocheted off through the air, buzzing and humming like some incredible insect. The shots died down as the magazines were emptied, until quickly there was no more shooting. 
The young man was elated. Through that astonishing fusillade, he had come unscathed. He glanced back. Yes, they had emptied their magazines. He could see several reloading. Others were running behind the house for their horses. As he looked, two already mounted came back into view around the corner, riding hard. At the same moment, he saw the man with the unmistakable ginger beard kneel down on the ground, level his gun, and coolly take his time for the long shot. The young man threw his spurs into the horse, crouched very low, and swerved in his flight in order to distract the other's aim, and still the shot did not come. With each jump of the horse, the wood sprang nearer. They were only two hundred yards away, and still the shot was delayed. Then he heard it, the last thing he was to hear, for he was dead ere he hit the ground in the long, crashing fall from the saddle. And they watched at the house, saw him fall, saw his body bounce when it struck the earth, and saw the burst of red-cheeked apples that rolled about him. They laughed at the unexpected eruption of apples, and clapped their hands in applause of the long shot by the man with the ginger beard. The End of War by Jack London This recording is in the public domain.